We went to Marham because there was a mosquito conversion unit there alongside the two Bomber Command mosquito squadrons, 139 and 105. And we did each did two trips, familiarization trips, on the mosquito, still with no idea where we were going to finish up or what we were going to be doing. And the CO then said, we're going to catch the night train up to the north of Scotland, where you, you were going to form a whole new squadron. And so we then went by train up to an airfield near Wick, in the very north of Scotland, and RAF Skitton became our home for the next few months. Skitton was a satellite from Wick, um, out on the moors, totally isolated, chosen because of the isolation, um, and we used some aircraft that were on loan to us from either one. 105 or 139 squadron. They were bomber command aircraft. Um, they made six aircraft available to us so that we could continue getting flying experience. And the 618 squadron, as it became, was constituted half by coastal command crews who had the experience of distance flying over the sea and the bomber command crews who knew all about uh, bombing as a as an activity, so these two uh, activities complemented each other, um, and we had these few aircraft on which we could share uh, some training flights. We had initially no idea why we were there; no one was telling us anything. The CO Hutchinson, Wing Commander Hutchinson, was still somewhere in the south of England. And he came up after about three days with a Provost Marshal and 24 RAF corporal, police corporals. And we were then summoned to the operations room and told what our future mission was. The Provost Marshal, the DAPM, then outlined the security which was going to surround us. Uh, in very simple, clear terms, you are here isolated and everything that you do will be top secret. We learned then for the first time that we were going to have a new weapon, details of which would be followed, would be learned in due course. We were told that we were going to do carry out a daylight attack on the German battleship Tirpitz which was at that time based in Trondheim and on the Norwegian coast, halfway up the Norwegian coast, and that we were going to use a new top secret weapon. And the weapon was the element of surprise. It, the raid had to be carried out within 24 hours of an, another operation, which we had no reason to know about. Um, and would be taking place within six weeks of our arriving at Skitton. So we were faced with learning how to fly this new aircraft with a weapon that we hadn't seen and to navigate our way into Norway and back as a formation of 20 aircraft, all of which had to be attained in six weeks. Initially, the testing was done at Reculver uh, down on the Kent coast by squadron leader Charlie Rose, one of our flight commanders. Um, but once we had the modified aircraft and the store, as we called it, we didn't call it a bomb, we called it a store so that it wouldn't be identified by name as a, as a mine or, or a bomb. And once we had gained some experience on that, then we went out and we attacked a French battleship which was moored in Loch Striven on the west coast near Danoon. So we would fly around the Cape, Cape Ross and down into Loch Striven and carry out low level attacks there with simulated low level attacks, dropping both we carried two two bombs and we would drop both of them where and they would be photographed both on the 
on the ship itself and from cameras that were mounted on the sides of the lock. They were mounted in tandem within the bomb bay. Bomb bay doors had been removed, of course, so that the underside, looking at the underside of the aircraft, there was about, I suppose, eight inches of the diameter protruding below these pair, pair of bombs. And they would be set sp spinning, I think, to about 900 revs a minute, um, spinning in reverse because the, the whole um, skill was to get them to bounce by uh, spinning in reverse and they would then bounce on the water and bounce very effectively and when they had to hit a solid object like the hull of a German battleship the spinning would cause the bomb to stay with the surface that it hit until of course it reached a level where a depth charge pistol would then detonate the bomb. And the weakest part of the turpits was known to be near the keel. Above the, above the keel there was armour, that was some of it was, was five inches thick, so quite impervious to anything that we were able to throw, throw at it. So how successful were you with the device? In terms of calm water, uh, quite successful, but there were problems in the balance with the, the balance within the uh, bomb itself. The material within the bomb was critical because if that was balance was not right, there would tend to be a wobble on the bomb as it dropped. The speed was also critical, as was the surface of the water. Um, so that on one occasion, for example, we dropped both stores with a three second delay between them and it was interesting to see the second bomb overtake the first one because its pattern of hitting the water was a better pattern than the first one. It was so critical. The biggest problem of course for us uh, which we identified right at the outset as soon as we heard about this was the, the distance from our base at Skitten up to the target and after they had planned this operation the Tirpitz left Trondheim and made its base in future in Carfjord which was way north of Tromso some 920 miles from Sambra in the Shetland Islands which was our nearest takeoff point. The Mosquito fully laden had a range of about 1150 miles and it doesn't need a maths degree to realize there was a big disparity if you were hoping to return. We began to realize that this was going to be a one-way trip because no one could offer a sensible means of our getting back to uh, Blighty. We began to think that these visits from VIPs was something of a farewell chap's visit. Uh, thanks for doing what you're about to do. Of the various suggestions that came from senior officers as to how we might overcome this um, distance problem, it's beyond belief as we sit quietly now thinking about it that these suggestions were made as in serious comment. For example, one was that the Royal Navy would put an aircraft carrier into the Arctic Circle in the vicinity but way offshore from Tromso and we would fly out, that is what was left after facing 105 anti-aircraft guns on the Tirpitz plus all their shore batteries, the, what was left of you would then fly out to sea and we'd fly over the aircraft carrier where we would all jump out into the sea and they would launch uh, the Admiral's launches from the aircraft carrier and pick up those that they could find. Uh, omitting the fact that if you landed in the Arctic Circle you had about two minutes of life before hypothermia set in 
that you were weighed down with all your flying kit, the probability of getting out of a mos mosquito uh, in one piece was pretty low, and the Royal Navy were not about to risk an aircraft carrier in waters that were infested by German U-boats just to rescue a few RAF bods. So the final solution was that we would fly back out to sea from Carfiord, would turn back inland uh, at Narvik, because at Narvik there's a railway line that went down across Norway into Sweden, down to the Gulf of... I've forgotten the name of the Gulf in Sweden. There was a train that carried iron ore down to be loaded out from the Swedish ports. And that train went through pine forests. So we could find the railway line and fly down the railway line until we ran out of fuel and then we'd land on the treetops and make our way down to the ground and wait there until a passing train came and we would catch that to uh, into Sweden. We would then be taken from that port down to Stockholm uh, where we would be kept there, uh, what the RAF called Brighton. The Bright Stockholm was known as Brighton and we would stay there until the uh, foreign office could find some way of wangling us back to England. I was 19 at the time, stuck in this place, not able to talk to anybody about what we were doing and the, the prospect of dying at 19 didn't appeal to me at all. The idea previously that one day I might be shot down, that was a, a good battle, but the idea of going out and deliberately being killed appealed to me much, much less. And there we were. The date of the attack came and went. We heard on the radio that a squadron had bombed some dams in Germany. That was the first time we had any intimation that there was another squadron, 617 squadron, uh, doing that job. We learnt about that. April became May, June and July and we still were training and trying to overcome these problems of distance and the technical problems. And then a notice went up on the station notice board to say that a corporal was arranging dancing classes if anybody would like to sign up. Uh, and we thought, well, that really is the pits when we've got to doing nothing but dancing classes. We've been sitting here now since the end of March and it's now July and nothing has happened. They did then decided to disband the squadron until they had resolved the problem of uh, performance of the weapon and they in fact where the squadron was later reinstated and went out to Australia but that's another story <laughs>